السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the bestower of mercy. All praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Indeed, Allah is deserving of the best of thanks and the most beautiful of praises. And we testify that no one is worthy of worship but Allah alone without any partners, the true supreme king. Just as we bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was indeed his prophet and his servant and his messenger, whom he sent as a mercy to the worlds. I welcome back the respected viewers to Imanology in this, our third episode as we begin our discussion on the fundamentals of Iman now. And these fundamentals of Iman refer to what was narrated in Sahih Muslim on behalf of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encountered an angel, an angelic encounter that was witnessed by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, themselves. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, says, as we were sitting there with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man appeared that had very white clothing and very dark hair that did not appear to be traveling, yet none of us knew him. And then he moved forward and he sat in front of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's placed his knees to the knees of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and placed his hands on his thighs. And then he said, O oh Muhammad, inform me about Islam. So our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Islam is to testify that none is worthy of worship but Allah and that I am the Messenger of Allah, and to establish the Salah, the prayer, and to pay the Zakah, the charity, and to fast Ramadan, and to make pilgrimage to the Kaaba, to make Hajj, for whomever is able to do so. And these are what we call the fundamentals of Islam, or the five pillars of Islam, or the very core of Islam, if you will. So upon hearing this answer, the man, the stranger, said, Sadaq, you've said the truth. Umar says, so we are perplexed. How can you ask him and then confirm his answer? So either you don't know the answer, and that's why you're asking, or you knew the answer and you were asking, in that case that would be disrespectful. The point is, the man continued and said, tell me about Iman, and this is the point of reference, but we're mentioning the entirety of the hadith for the benefit, in case we haven't heard it, or to review it if we had. Inform me about Iman. So he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Iman is to believe in Allah and to amina billah. وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ and his angels وَكُتُبِهِ and his books وَرُسُلِهِ and his messengers وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ with the last day وَأَن تُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ and to believe in قَدَر fate or destiny the good of it and the evil so the man once again said صَدَقْتِ you said the truth then he said inform me about إِحْسَان or excellence if you will inform me about إِحْسَان so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ to worship Allah as though you see him فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاهُ and if you cannot see him, then he sees you. The man said, then inform me about the hour. So he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمْ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The one being asked about it does not know any more than the one asking. Meaning the knowledge of the hour, meaning with regards to its appointed time, that is disclosed to no one, not the greatest of prophets, not the nearest of the angels. This is solely with Allah. He said, the one being asked about it doesn't know any more than the one asking. He said, then at least, Inform me about Amaratiha, its signs, its portents, some of the indicators that it's coming to pass soon. He said to him, Antalid al Amatu Rabbataha, for a girl to give birth to her master. And for you to see the barefoot and naked shepherds of sheep competing in the construction of tall buildings. Upon hearing that answer, the man sufficed and he left. And then we sat for a while, Umar says. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Umar, you know who that questioner was? The one asking all the questions? I said, Allah and His Messenger know best. Meaning of the manners not to answer when Allah and His Messenger are there. Allah and His Messenger know best. So he said, this was Jibreel. This was the Archangel Gabriel. Atakum yu'allimukum deenakum. He came to teach you your religion. Meaning the reason why he was asking these questions, though the answers are known to him, is not to be informed about them. No, he knows nor to disrespect and test the Prophet ﷺ, no, but rather to reiterate to you the crux of your religion, the summary of your religion, the fundamentals of Islam, the pillars of Islam, the fundamentals of Iman, the pillars of Iman, and Ihsan and the hour and its portents. So let us take from this hadith, inshaAllah, those six pillars. Iman is to believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His messengers and the last day 
and to believe in fate, destiny, the good of it and the evil. These are the pillars of Iman. Believing in them, at least even if just holistically, is minimal Iman. To believe that they're true is a requirement for being a Muslim. But to study them in depth and to live in their shade is the gateway to enjoying both this world and the next. So we begin inshaAllah Azza wa Jal with the first of them, to believe in Allah. And this is the most important pillar and the one around which everything else revolves. And if you notice the hadith says Allah and His angels, His books, His messengers, right? So the greatest of the pillars of Iman, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean to believe in Allah? And what are the implications of a person saying, I believe in Allah? Surely it's not just to say that He exists because many of those who we know are not people of Iman believe that Allah exists nor to even believe that he's the creator. For shaitan, the devil, believes that Allah is the creator. And he's not a believer, he's not a person of Iman. So what does it mean to believe in Allah? We're going to discuss belief in Allah with regards to four respects. His existence, his rububiyya, his lordship, his uluhiyya, his divinity, a right to be worshipped, and his asma'ul sifat, his names and his attributes. These are the pillars of the first pillar. I mean, the first pillar of Iman is to believe in Allah. And then these are the four pillars that we're going to discuss as an explanation of what it means to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So establishing these four pillars is establishing your belief in Allah. And a deficiency in any of these four pillars is a deficiency or it could even be a nullifier to your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to believe in Allah's existence, perhaps this will take us an episode or two to discuss it inshallah and give it its due rights. What do we mean that we believe in Allah's existence? Meaning we believe that Allah actually exists and that it's not just a concept because there's an assumption out there that belief in God is a concept, a social construct, the brainchild of man. Meaning it was constructed throughout human history for other motives, not because it's true and correct. So to keep the dictators in power, to keep the human beings decent and moral and the likes, that it was kept as a mechanism to keep the masses in line with regards to not objecting and revolting against the elites. And that's why some people believe that when they've reached a certain degree of sophistication as human beings, they no longer needed that mechanism. And that's why you hear Nietzsche, for example, talking about the death of God. And about a hundred years ago, you had Thomas Arnold write his notorious poem, God's Funeral, right? And they're not the first to do this. Allah tells in the Quran that the people of Ad also reached a certain level of sophistication. They also deleted from their conscience intentionally and buried within it that there's no such thing as a greater power. And Allah records that statement of theirs in the Quran. Man ashaddu minna quwwa, who is greater than us in power? And here we go again with history repeating itself. So not because the existence of Allah requires much explanation, but because there's so much clamor out there with regards to it, we're going to be in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dispel some of these misconceptions and establish what is already established inside of every single human being with regards to the existence of Allah. We're going to discuss the proofs of Allah's existence from five angles. Though in reality, these are not the only five and no one should ever think so. Because we know that the proof to Allah's existence is prevalent throughout the universe. And it exists in the number of creations that exist. As the poet says, وَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ آيَةٌ تَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ الْوَاحِدُ And in every single thing is a sign, as an indication that He is the one and only. But those five angles that we will discuss, the first of them, inshaAllah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is instinct human instinct. The second is logic. The third is experience. The fourth is design. And the fifth is revelation. So the first proof of Allah's existence is instinct, or what we call in Islam, fitra. This is the greatest proof to the existence of Allah. Before the profound arguments, and the flawless explanations, and the entertaining rebuttals at times. Before all that, the belief of Allah's existence is ingrained in every single human being 
without exception. And that's why Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says something very beautiful. And he says, مَنْ بَنَا دِينَهُ عَلَى الْقِيَاسِ لَمْ يَزَلْ دَهْرُهُ فِي التباس. He says, whomever builds his religious commitment, belief in Allah and whatever follows, right? Whoever builds their religion upon qiyas, upon analogies, like arguments and deductions and the likes, philosophy, if you will, he will remain for his eternity in confusion. Because every time you fix one argument, another one arises. You fix this one, another one arises. But rather a person by his fitrah knows that Allah exists, even if he doesn't have the ability to understand the argument of what is being said by the proponents of the opposite view. And that's why when one of the Muslim philosophers was passing by a, a crowd, someone who became overly immersed in philosophy, unfortunately, in Islamic history, they told the woman, don't you know who this man is? You don't want to come out and see him. This is a man who has established a thousand proofs to Allah's existence. She said in her simplicity, though she was not as learned as him, she said that he must have had a thousand doubts, meaning what do we need proof that Allah exists for, right? So this is established and ingrained inside of every single human being and every jinn deep within their hearts and their souls. They know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that he is above them by way of this fitrah. This fitrah is the innate nature upon which Allah disposed his slaves. This is what we would call the factory settings, if you will, or the default programming. Allah the Most High says in the Quran, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطُرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ So turn your face to the religion wholeheartedly. This is the fitrah of Allah. This is the natural way of Allah upon which He disposed humanity. There is no alteration possible in the creation of Allah, meaning in the way that He created every single brand new human being that comes out. He comes out with this set of default programming and its implications. To learn more about the fitrah bi stay with us after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, inshallah. And we were discussing the fitrah, right? That natural inclination, that upon it is every single human being that is the most indicative and most powerful proof to the existence of Allah. The verse that was mentioned that Allah created every human being like this and there is no alteration in the creation of Allah. This matches the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim wherein the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ Every single newborn is born upon this fitrah, this natural inclination to recognize that they have a creator. This is what is meant by the fitrah, not necessarily who that creator is, nor what his names and attributes are, or the likes, but are upon this natural inclination that they have a creator, and that Allah is that creator, the most perfect and the most high. He says, and then his parents turn him into either a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshiper. He says, just like a Sheep that is born jam'a, without any flaws. Do you see it born without its ears, meaning like its mother? He gave a beautiful example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that even if you take a sheep and you cut off its ears, this was a practice that existed in their time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he strikes this example. He says, when that sheep now has a child, does that child come out without the ears because the mother didn't have ears, or does it get reset to the default creation, the way Allah placed it? And you know this fact with regard to the existence of Allah being unerasable from the human race by virtue of this fitrah is established in our very age as clear as day where in the former USSR after the fall of communism and the atheism that was promoted <laughs> hard over there readers, digests and others have carried statistics that now just one generation later these lands with Russia and Poland and the sub-states that are under Russia, an overwhelming majority of that new generation that is born, they believe in one God. Regardless of the religions, you cannot erase that from the human race. Where did this fitrah come from? Many of the scholars, they infer that it came from our initial conversation with Allah when we were still souls, before we were born into this world, 
that is referred to in Surah Al-A'raf, wherein Allah, the mighty and majestic, he says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدِنَا أَنْ تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ And remember when your Lord took from the backs of the children of Adam their offspring and he made them testify against themselves saying, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, we testify, O Allah. He said, why all this dialogue? He says in the end of the ayah, so they don't come on the day of judgment, so that you don't show up on the last day saying we were unaware. And that's why a human being, he gets born into this world with this set, even though he doesn't remember the actual incident. Meaning if he was born on an island somewhere, quarantined from any polytheistic influences, right? He would know that Allah exists. And his heart would be attached to his Lord and Master and Maker that is above him. And in times of distress, he will look up. This is within the human being. And that's why we say that those who claim to be atheists, many times say, how do I speak to an atheist who says God doesn't exist? I don't believe God exists. I'm an atheist. Time and time again, we tell them, and we as Muslims believe that an atheist does not exist. Rather, deep down inside, whether he realizes it or not, he believes that Allah exists. And this becomes clear to him in times of difficulty. But in front of you, he may never admit it. As Allah the Most High says in the Quran, so that you will know for sure that an atheist does not exist. Rather, the human being has full insight with regards to himself, even if he may send forth his excuses. It doesn't exist. A person may have a philosophical reason why they think they're an atheist, meaning there's a doubt or an argument they heard that they just didn't know the answer for, so they settle, right? Or there could even be a psychological reason why a person's an atheist. Not that they don't believe in God, but they don't want to believe in God. But a true atheist does not exist, as the scholars of Islam have mentioned. The second proof is simply logic. Allah the Most High says in the Quran, in Surah At-Tur, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Were they created out of nothingness, or were they themselves the creators? A person can reply to these uh, rhetorical questions, though a reply is not meant because deep down inside the answer is known, in four ways. The verse says, were they created from nothing or are they the creators? So a person can say, no, I wasn't even created to begin with, right? I was always here. And this is illogical, right? A person knows, even scientifically speaking, the human being is not constant, right? So how can he accept us to accept and agree that a rational explanation that he was always here, he wasn't created? Secondly, he'll say, okay, I was created out of nothing. And this too is not very rational, not very logical, because we don't know of any creation out of nothing. Yet you want to insist that you, the walking, talking, arguing, complex human being came out of nothing. This is illogical, this is nonsensical. You know, 350 years ago, in 1668, Francisco Reddy, we learned in school that he finished his famous spontaneous generation experiment. That they used to think that bad meat made flies out of nothing, maggots and then flies. And then when he finished his experiment, he realized there's no such thing as spontaneous generation. It just came out of nothing. Rather, they didn't notice, they couldn't see with the naked eye that there was a fly coming and laying the eggs there. And now we laugh about that belief of something coming out of nothing. But a person, perhaps, for ulterior motives, accepts that illogical explanation. So he can say, I was not created, I was always here. Or he can say that I came out of nothing, also illogical. He'll say, okay, I created myself. Because the verse says, were they created out of nothing, or did they create themselves? This too is illogical. You created yourself. Tell me now, can you do it again? If you did it the first time, and you're past the trial and error stage, and you got all the kinks out of the system, as they say, please repeat it. Or else you're going to have to agree with me that it's illogical for a person to say that they created themselves. And the fourth answer, the only logical answer, is that you have a creator. So this verse established that there must be a creator, logically speaking, irrespective of who that creator is for now. Now, also of the logical arguments that are simple and basic and obvious analogy, is the argument of causality, that everything that you know in existence, something put it into existence. 
No one actually believes that the footprints were just there in the sand and the iPhone just appeared out of nowhere. This is not at all a notion that a rational person would say or accept. Everything has a cause behind it. The concept of cause and effect. So this is what we know and what we observe. So by analogy now, every single thing, whether we've observed it or not, must follow this rule, right? Every effect has a cause behind it. But though there must be an exception, how can this continue forever? If this continued without end, everything would be waiting on its prior cause. Everything would be waiting on the prior cause. So there must be one exception. An exception where there is an effect, a beginning, and that which put it into effect. That which began it was not put into effect by anything. One that is not dependent on anything before it. Not even time or space, right? And this is exactly how Allah, the Most High, described Himself in the Qur'an. In the greatest verse in the Qur'an, Ayat al-Kursi, in Surah al-Baqarah, Allah, the Most High, says what? Allah, la ilaha illa huwa al al qayyum Allah, none is worthy of worship but Him, al hayy the ever-living, so He's not dependent on time. al qayyum the one that sustains and maintains everything, and everything seeks Him out for its existence, right? This is who Allah is. He is the first, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mighty and majestic. This is also the meaning of the name of Allah as samad that we read in Surah Al-Ikhlas. We say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, He is Allah, the one and only, Allah samad Allah, the sustainer, as it's roughly translated. al samad in the language of the Arabs is the one that is sought for the needs of others. So in other words, as samad Allah is the one that everyone and everything needs at every moment while he does not need anyone or anything at any moment. And this is similar to the argument of the prime mover that was posed by Aristotle in the past, except that the perfection of the Quranic argument is free from some of the flaws of the prime mover discussion with regards to proving that a creator, a maker, Allah Almighty, God exists. So we said instinct and we said logic. The third proof that Allah exists, we said is experience. And experience means what we human beings have experienced throughout our lives is enough by itself of a proof that there is a God and that God exists. And this experience will be divided inshaAllah subhanahu wa ta'ala into two classifications. Our personal human experiences and number two, the prophetic experience. What we've experienced from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even if we've lived today 1400 years after his life, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his family and his followers. But that will leave inshaAllah to the next episode. So be with us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I stand before you with an attentive heart Erase my sins from the present and past To you I pray, bow down prostrate You are the only one worthy of praise I stand before you with an attentive heart Erase my sins from the present and past Oh